Many of you may have been to many different kinds of blockchain or energy events. And then you wonder what's the difference between this one and all the other events. The biggest difference is that we have some really, really cool original work being done here. And we are not talking nonsense. We're talking serious issues. Um, so in the next session, you are going to be the first in the world first in the world to have a tutorial on a very new emerging topic that has never been talked about before. So you are very, very lucky. You are in for this great treat. Um, I don't think anybody has done anything like that before anywhere in the world. So, so we are literally in the first one you know, on this series of topics. So the topic we're going to talk about today is something called a low voltage right through, right? Uh, it, it really is a very technical topic, but it has a lot of implication with the blockchain and in particular with the crypto miners uh, in the state and other, where, uh, other, other places. It is something that uh, we have been doing uh, over the past year with, 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 with collaboration with uh, Professor Injeti and, and several of our researchers here. Uh, Hassan, Sama, uh, Shavir, uh, and Anindita. Uh, we, we're going to give you a tutorial, which is an in-depth view of this topic. It's a very, very hot topic now uh, that is uh, being discussed at the Large Flexible Load Task Force. We're going to try to provide a, a demystifying, try to demystify what, what exactly is low voltage price, right? And why should we care about? And, and some of the uh, lab testing that we are doing uh, in the lab uh, at Texas A&M, and also some of the in-depth modeling and analysis uh, that will hopefully provide some insights on, on this issue at the grid uh, interconnection level. Uh, before we get started, let me just quickly do a show of hands. How many of you here are engineers? And how many of you consider yourself as an electrical engineer? Okay, good. So this is a this is a very good crowd, and this is exactly the kind of audience we are preparing this for. Uh, so uh, I hope that even if you are non-engineer, you get something out of it. Uh, you understand at least why we care about it, and, and and what is the reason behind caring about it. At a very high level, a uh, we're talking about some emerging demand interconnected to the grid, right? And you may want to understand what exactly is the grid. So the grid or the power system, as we understand it, it, it evolves over a whole wide range of time scale and spatial scales. But low voltage right through is one of the many, many time scales that power system engineers have to care about when it comes to integration of new devices and new resources. Now, let me just break down that a little bit to you. You can, at a very broad level, think about uh, uh, the issues uh, at the market level and at the physical level, right? At the market level is what's on the top. And the physical level is what's on the bottom, right? For organizations like ERCOT, we'll have to deal with both levels, right? And uh, on the market level, things are typically evolving in terms of a time scale uh, of five minutes or longer uh, in terms of time scale, right? A real time market is typically a five minute, it's really not, I mean, it's not real time, it's five minute ahead uh, uh, market, right? And you have hour ahead, you have day ahead, and so on. Whereas on the physical level, a lot of activities are happening because the power grid is never is never at steady state. We we might think the power system is at a steady state thanks to a lot of uh, engineers and ERCOT and, and utilities and, and so on. They keep the lights on at a 
flows to steady state, but it was never at steady state, right? So what is steady state? So if you take a measurement on this wall socket, what do you get? You get some kind of a sinusoidal electrical current or electrical voltages, right? So you may wonder, it's never steady. Why, why do you call it a steady state? We call it a steady state when it's perfect sinusoidal. Right? That's the basis of AC power grid, right? So it is changing, but it's, if it's changing according to a perfect sinusoid, we call it a steady state. But the real world is that if you measure it, not only is changing, it is changing very much unlike a perfect sinusoid. So there's all kinds of uh, wiggles and distortion and stuff like that. And that's the transient dynamics that we're talking about. And this transient dynamic is caused by activities at multiple time scales. Again, at multiple time scales. And uh, low voltage right through is speaking about an issue that is happening at almost the most minuscule level time scale issues that we're talking about, right? Again, as we talked about on the market side, it was five minutes, and that's about the, the, the fastest. And then you get into the physical side, you are worried things like load flow analysis or power flow analysis, where people are trying to schedule the generator and demand so that they meet. Uh, and that is typically happening on a sort of a, a second by second or 30 second by 30 second basis. Right. And then you will have things like so-called frequency regulation, right? Something which also has a counterpart on the market side called frequency up, frequency down market. That is happening on the time scale of four seconds or you know, one second basis, right? And then you're gonna have something called electromechanical dynamics. Things like governor swinging, you know, you have a lot of thermal generators, right? The thermal generators, when they're subject to some disturbances, these generators will have some uh, change of speed. That change of speed on their rotors uh, is, is, is characterized in the time scale of a split second. This is something we call electromechanical transient processes. And these are typically governed by uh, things that you all learned from high school, right? Something called Newton's law, right? Newton's law, remember? Yeah. So, uh, and then you get into the finest time scale, which is this kind of a, what we call traveling wave or electromagnetic transit processes, EMTPs. These are typically the things that you care about when there's a lightning strike, when there is a fault happening in one of the generators. They propagate throughout the network at very, very fast speed. We're talking about microseconds. So what is microsecond? 10 to the power of negative six. So that's the time scale we're talking about. So low voltage drive through is falling in the category of something we study at the so-called electromagnetic transient time scale. Now you wonder, why in the world do I care about that as a minor? Well, you care about it because some events were happening. Uh, this is some report that uh, uh, we, we got uh, recently from ERCOT, some recent examples. There, there was a fault without meaning, without specifying where exactly the location, but somewhere in West Texas, there's a fault. And that fault was happening at that uh, green uh, star point. Again, what is fault? Fault is like a tree touching the line, or the generator short circuited, right? That's a fault. And there is another fault that happened in Odessa. And guess what? Somewhere as far as like 200 miles away from the center of the fault, was able to record some strange voltage profiles. This again is a uh, obtained from some uh, recent report uh, published by Ericard. As you can see, the, the lighting is not perfect, but I hope you can see that there's a big uh, voltage dip 
right? That, that voltage dip uh, was corresponding to the event of that fault. And because of that voltage dip that was happening, not necessarily at the load of large flexible load, it led to some tripping of some of these large loads, including some of these large flexible loads, right? So something is happening in one location and 200 miles away, something got tripped. And if you are the grid operator, you would be worried, you would be concerned, right? Because we're not talking about small size demand, we're talking about hundreds of megawatts of demand, right? The whole city of College Station is about 100, right? So it's a big, big amount of load. There is another example, which actually just happened very recently in December, uh, which led to a reduction of about 1.6 gigawatt of, uh, of demand, which is a mix. We don't know exactly the percentage, but it's a mix of uh, large flexible loads, oil and gas loads, and other industrial loads, right? So there's a need to understand when something is happening on the grid, how should these large loads behave, especially at this very finite, very minuscule time scale of electromagnetic transient process? And how does their behavior would in turn respond back to the grid and hopefully you know understand their 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 response back to the grid because it's a dynamically interactive process. So it's a very complex issue to start with. Uh, to, to kind of a dissect that, uh, we decided that we should take a two-prone approach. The first approach is just to understand the issue from some real experiments, right? After all, we are engineers. How engineers work on things is that we try to solve problems by trial and errors, right? So we're just gonna test it out because of the, you know, we thanks to the lab that we have here. And then using the lab testing results, we want to develop some understanding, which hopefully would provide some insights on, on perhaps scaling these issues to the larger grid and larger demand. So that's what we're going to talk about next. And I don't know who, Hassan or Prasad, you're going to come and talk about this, uh, uh, this part now? Yeah, I'll just start it off. Okay. Thank you, Leigh, for that introduction. I think it is uh, really important to see what is what is going through and so on. Uh, this is a uh, few slides on our, our quality laboratory that we need to over 20 years old as to how we were able to uh, design an active harmonic filter and install in a building that is kind of technology we licensed it to the to the industry. And then we also worked on uh, you know voltage right through with the uh, Toshiba Industrial Systems uh, in right in Houston, Texas, where all these motor drives are running critical loads, right? Like fans and pumps and so on. And whenever there's a voltage set, a chemical industry, then the machine and the motor drive turns off and there is a big economic loss. So we were uh, working closely with these engineers, modifying the, the drive to add on box, which the customer will pay for, and essentially will write through. The good thing about this uh, technology was that you had a motor which is rotating and it had inertia in it, the power suddenly went out, the motor was still spinning. And, and you could use that little bit of that mechanical energy back into electrical, uh, keep the electronics running, right? And then when the power came back, then, then you just do flight restart. So, so, so that technology is commercial today. And it is, it's a, almost like a standard option. You don't have to pay extra. Just like you buy a car, Tesla, and everything is in the car, but it just doesn't enable anything. Self-driving is 15,000 and so on. It's already built into the car. So a lot of this electronics are already built into that, into the motor drives. So that's one of our technology there. And then the critical facilities, uh, we had another project uh, some time back about right through for critical loads. 
aspects. And there are um, there, there are commercial products available now around this. Basically, you have a utility supply, and out there is a critical load. And then you put an electronic breaker right there. And then you have this additional electronics, which whenever there is a transient, uh, that's immediately the power is transferred through this alternative pad, you know, in milliseconds, in, in the less than half a cycle. And then and then and the critical load uh, needs are met immediately. Uh, so there is there's commercial products out there you can look for and purchase them and install them. Now the question is, Bitcoin miners are not critical loads, right? Uh, I didn't want to offend anybody there here, but I think, <laughs> but it is, uh, it is a large flexible load, right? So therefore, whatever we talked about, critical loads is not applicable to Bitcoin miners. This must be different types of solutions need to be need to be thought of. Whatever solutions which are available, that if you directly cut and paste it, it's going to be a terribly expensive solution. As, as some new regulations can come in and so on. So I want you to think about that and not critical loads, right? And that's been something when Leo and I were working, these are not critical loads. How do we actually deal with it? You know, satisfy the needs of the utility as well as the loads and so on, right? So because they're flexible loads. So uh, uh, I think uh, the next uh, line of thinking is, uh, the next several slides of my students, Hassan will present it. But the what is saying is like 20 years ago, there was a you know electric power research institute did a lot of study on all the stack all across the country. So that's basically the duration, and the power suddenly goes away. That can happen. It happened yeah, yesterday, my home, <laughs> as as I came in, and I have a so something called a king monitor. You can stick it in. I think State Farm Insurance Company gave me a king monitor. Then you put it in, it just immediately tells me on my phone, your power is lost, or you're not the only one. A lot of other team customers in your neighborhood, like 20 of them also lost power. So that's the that's the amount of knowledge we have on, on the internet of things, connected things. So, so that those things happen. And these events are more common, like a SAG, uh, may, I think Professor Lay talked about this event being happening not necessarily in a neighborhood, maybe hundred miles away. There was some, there was a fault or something, and there was a there was a sag at this location, right? So this could be a, a wide area implication. So, so using that, I think um, um, there's so many reasons for reclosing, and you know whenever there's a, a fault current that occurs, and the breaker trips for thirty cycles and recloses and so on. So all of these things happening 100 miles away may cause some, definitely causes, uh, depending on location, the, the, the you know, voltage problems, right, at a certain location. So this is a particular curve um, called a, a CBMA curve on computer business equipment manufacturing folks. They say, hey, if, you, if you're designing these electronics and connect to the wall socket, you need to go the wall socket loses power for 8.3 milliseconds. That's half a cycle. One cycle of 60 hertz electricity is one by 60 seconds. It's about 16 milliseconds. Um, in Europe, it's 50, so it's like 20 milliseconds. And then, uh, so half of that is 8.33 milliseconds. So even they're building elevators, all of them have to write through that. Uh, so all of those, uh, that hash area is, is, is the no trip zone, and the other thing below that is the equipment can, can actually turn off and so on. So with the Toshiba drives, we are trying to extend that road region down the, the bottom line down below so we can get through a lot of these more disturbances and have the critical facility keep running. So now, uh, so that's our lab setup, which I already talked about, where we have a programmable power supplies and this is one of them, but we also have a bigger one which can do 50 kilowatt to three-phase three phase equipment to, in which we can actually power three-phase Bitcoin miners and then kind of subject them to all these voltages and uh, test them. I think I'll skip this one since I already presented that. This is my last slide. I'd like you to think about these things. Uh, maybe prepares uh, the audience wants to listen to this, maybe uh, 
to all the presentation here to uh, maybe ask questions. The primary purpose of voltage right through, you know, preservation of bulk and grid security. I think I think ERCOT is here. They're trying to preserve the bulk grid uh, from collapsing or grid security, as they talked about. So far, is that a local transmission, uh, you know, can cause very low distribution voltages and longer, uh, you know, longer falls. So these these falls, however, are not critical to bulk grid. So why? So you need to actually carefully craft the voltage right through requirements. Uh, you know, maybe this workshop can help that. And then, um, then, then these questions. And what is then a reasonable right through for a large flexible load? I think that's as a group. You know, we did look at that when you bring in regulations. And then is zero voltage right through required for a large flexible load? I don't know. In my mind, I don't know that. So, uh, is it required? Maybe a lot more studies and needs to be done. And this group needs to discuss that. So. Well, the last point is basically in any any mining facility or any huge industrial complex or generators, they have a lot of other auxiliaries uh, around it, cooling system fans, pumps, and running. So the zag happens, maybe the machines will ride through, but then then those equipment may actually turn off, and then that will that will impede the entire facility. So one needs to not only just look at the Bitcoin mining hardware, but also all the auxiliaries which are supporting that supporting the facility in terms of cooling so when you plan all of that so that those planning has to happen so basically what i'm trying to say is it'll increase the expense of providing the right through it's not just the one thing but a lot of other auxiliaries around it too so with that i'll, I'll leave the leave uh, leave it to the next uh, uh more detailed tutorial i think thank you Hello everyone, uh, my name is Hassan. I'm a PhD student working with Dr. Njiti on the uh, power electronics and the hardware side of this uh, project. So today I'll be giving a quick background educational, a little bit of educational background on voltage disruptions and then give different curves and standards and then talk about where the minor fits in all this. So first uh, I'll go over quickly what are voltage disruptions. So basically, what is a voltage ride through? So a voltage ride through is the ability of the load to ride through during um, one of those events where there was a voltage sag or swell. And um, it is important for uh, large loads, such as the data centers and in our case, Bitcoin miners, to ride through these events because they do contribute to the uh, stability of the grid. Now, when a fault occurs on the grid, um, the voltage can drop significantly. And um, large loads, is, if, if it is not able to ride through it, then that could uh, lead to catastrophic events on the grid. So quickly, let's see what is a voltage uh, sag. So a voltage sag, as uh, we can see here, is when the voltage of the grid drops to a fraction of the voltage of the nominal voltage or the nominal voltage. And this happens on different timelines. Here we have it between 0.5 cycles, which is 8.3 milliseconds, like Dr. NGT just uh, explained to a one minute. And this is the duration of what we can call a voltage sag. Um, a voltage swell is also similar, but is when the voltage grid goes to a fraction higher than the nominal or normal uh, voltage. And it's also within the same timeline. Now, if we looked at um, different timelines um, of similar events, for, for example, an over voltage or an under voltage, uh, these two events in an over voltage, the voltage was higher and the voltage lower, but for a very extended duration of time, anything higher than. For our case, for our scenario, we really want to focus on the momentary between 0.5 cycles and 3 seconds and see where, what does the miner, how does the miner react in these uh, timelines. Also, there is also another point of interest, which is um, the short term power interruption. And that's when the voltage goes to zero not just a fraction of the uh, nominal value, but directly to zero. And different curves, different uh, standards consider this uh, timeline, or you know, they expect the load to ride through different times. Uh, I'm gonna go over again later, but these are just a quick um, examples. The beam are expected to ride for half a cycle. Other uh, standards are expected to ride for much longer in a zero voltage. And during these events, the load is expected to continuously be uh, connected to the grid and drive through these events. 
So here I'm going to go over different curves and standards. I'm going to go over the Sigma curve, the ITIC curve, which is just a new Sigma, and then one of the curves that is presented in the IEEE 1547 standards and the 1668 standards. So there are a lot of voltage right to requirements, and it can vary depending on a different variety of uh, factors. It could be the um, criticality of the load, the connection to the grid, a different, uh, different um, requirement, different factors. So, and different applications and scenarios may require tailored voltage right through planning to see, uh, to oversee a safe operation when these events happen. So first I'll start with the uh, Sigma curve. So again, Sigma is the Computer Business Equipment Manufacturing Association. Uh, this curve is what we see in a standard and it represents the tolerance of sensitive electronic equipment uh, such as the specifically computer and IT equipment, uh, computers, printers, all the things that you can find in an office. Um, this is a very uh, populated graph. Uh, we can see here the zero voltage uh, that is expected to write through is, uh, half a cycle, but to show it in a more visual way, uh, here's a, just an empty curve with two of the curves, the over voltage and under voltage. This is the not trip zone, where anything that resides within these two curves is expected to write through. Uh, anything about, below a voltage of 106%, above 87% uh, is expected to ride through, even if it was interrupted to these uh, levels. Here's a quick example of how a half cycle group would look like on a grid. And uh, these equipments are expected to ride through such events. And um, here's another example where at one cycle at 6%, what it would look like on the voltage on the grid. And that's how the if and equipment experienced such um, variation in the way that should uh, ride through safely or expected to. Here's also another extended um, voltage disruption happens for uh, 10 cycles, 80%. We'll see uh, something like that on the grid and the load is also expected to ride through it. So if we go to the ITIC curve, which is again, just a newer Sigma uh, um, curve with more points and test points in there, um, we we'll also see that Similar, there's a not trip zone, anything that resides within these two curves. Um, this is an example of how a voltage slide would look like, and this is how would a voltage swell look like. And these spikes that you see are uh, due to, there are surge suppressors in each power electronic equipment that protects the machine if something like this happens, so it would continue to run uh, smoothly. Um, moving on, I'll go over one of the graphs or curves that are in the IEEE 1547 that deals with DERs. Those are renewable resources like uh, solar panels, um, wind turbines, all these renewable resources that has inverters, converters connected to them. Uh, here we also have a not trip zone. However, the zero voltage that is expected for those machines to ride through it is more than half cycle. It's nine cycles. It's 150 milliseconds. So that is much more extended time, and that is for the nature of the loads and there, which is as we uh, discussed, our PV panels and renewable resources. So these are the high and low voltage right through limits, and here is just a visualization on how long this nine cycle would look like at zero voltage. So the machine, when it ex experienced uh, such um, a drop in the voltage to zero, it is expected to ride through it and continuously be connected to the grid. Uh, this is the last uh, standard that I will cover. Um, it goes over uh, loads that are less than 1,000 volt. And it's in the table in the uh, standard, it shows two types of tags, a phase to ground and the phase to phase. Just a quick visualization at 50% of the uh, grid voltage that's expected to ride for 10 or 12 cycles, and then at 70% for 30 cycles, and then at 80% for uh, 120 cycles. So after we covered different graphs, different curves, uh, we wanted to go over how the machine will react or where it does it uh, fill in these uh, different graphs. How does it compare to these different graphs? So to do that, as Dr. Mbiti showed before, we have a, a lab, uh, the lab here, which includes a programmer power supply that allows us to recreate these events. We can recreate voltage time, voltage swells uh, for different time scales uh, within many seconds to just see how these machines can react. Can they ride? Can they not ride through? And to map out a curve for the machines that also Dr. Njuti showed uh, before. 
So just a quick background. This is how a machine looks like from the inside. Uh, it has a boost PFC and then uh, a low voltage DC converter and then uh, go to the minor processor. On the bottom here, we have one of the older machines which we took the power supply and then we tapped into the uh, DC link uh, voltages to just view what would the voltage look like when the when there's an event like that. How would the voltage come back up? So we began with different tests. We first, again, these are the testing points that we were uh, collecting. So we began with different tests. First, we tried the 9.5 millisecond zero voltage. And in this instance, we did the top of the DC link voltage oscillation. And in the bottom, we see how the voltage dropped suddenly for 9.5 milliseconds. And on the top, we can see the DC link uh, voltage drops down and it comes back, comes back up. So it rides through this event. And here's the, from a different point of view, we have the current. We can see also there is a lot of transient in the current, but the machine is able to ride through it and continues. Uh, to work smoothly. Uh, Here is a video on how the test looked like. So we see that at that point, the uh, zero voltage is uh, initiated, and then the bottom of the current you can see a lot of transient. Then, after this transient, the machine continues to run through. So we, we mapped out that at 9.5 milliseconds, at zero voltage, the machine can stand such events. We went then to a 12 millisecond uh, scenario. We saw that the DC link voltages could not recover from a 12 millisecond zero volt. So the machines had to turn off and then come back up, and that would take some time. Similarly, uh, we also looked at the current, and we saw the current, there's a big transient, and then an oscillation, and then the machine basically goes to idle mode, the fans are running, but then it takes some time to go back and connect and run back up. Um, this is how the test would look like. The 12 millisecond uh, voltage drop happened there, and this is how the current looks like. And then um, it continues to be like that for a couple of minutes, and then it comes back up. But it does disconnect and could not write through um, this duration of zero voltage. The last point we tried, or we're going to show here, is a voltage interruption. So we went to 67% of the original uh, value. So this is not like a cyber as well, this is a longer interruption. Just to show where the where does the machine, when where can the machine continually run? Like we showed before in the curves, the upper and lower bounds. Here we can decide, we decided that or we saw that the lower bound is 67%. We saw that the current, there's a current transient, and then the machine just turns off and does not come back up. And here is just to visualize uh, what happens, see the voltage dropping, and then the machine continuously just loses current and um, cannot come back up. So after we done all these testing, we could come up with this curve for the machine, where again, we have a not trip zone in these uh, regions. And then uh, this is the nominal value, 240 volts. And then the over voltage, we uh, checked it was 130%. And the under voltage was 75%. So whatever is below or beyond, uh, it could not, uh, you know, right through, but whatever is in between this region, the machine should, uh, you know, uh, fully be able to write through. And this is a quick uh, representation of how that one of the points would look like, like we showed before. Um, here we have around uh, 4.5 cycles and um, about 65% of the uh, voltage. And the machine is uh, experiencing such event that should write through it without problem. So now we want to um, compare it to all the other graphs that we showed. So we have the 1547, which was for the uh, DER's uh, renewable resources. We have the I-1668. Now we have our machines. And this is where the care fills within these uh, different ones. To show a more zoomed in um, picture, we have the uh, our lab results with all the other curves. We can see that if we're comparing the uh, Bitcoin miner to all the other curves, and specifically for the 15.7, see that the expected zero voltage right through 18 times more because we can write 0.5 cycles, they need nine cycles, so that's around 18 times. And um, here's just a quick, uh, you know, just to go over again what is a half cycle and what is nine cycles, and these are the differences uh, in between these two curves. So in this uh, presentation, I went over one machine, one miner, and what it would do or what would, uh, how would it write through 
these different uh, scenarios. Um, now we want to look at the bigger picture. What would happen in a larger facility? Larger facilities have thousands of miners. So what would happen to the grid, to the facilities, if it experiences such uh, low voltage or zero voltage events? So to do that, we have to build um, a more uh, a sophisticated, um, what we call it, system or model of the machine. And uh, that will be covered by uh, my colleague, and in data, she will go over different scenarios on how that would affect the grid. And uh, what are the ramifications of such uh, voltage drive through scenarios on the grid? Um, so that was my last slide. Um, thank you. Uh, my name is Anandita Samantha. I'm a second year master's student and doing my research with, under the advisor of Dr. Ishe. And my topic for research is on electromagnetic transient impacts of such crypto mining loads on the grid. Before we delve directly into the topic, let me first, or let us first envision how the future grid might look as. We know that there will be a surge of mining demands on the grid. Along with that, there will be a lot of inverter-based resources like solar, wind, all these things are just inverter-based resources which have power electronic converters and they cause instability in the grid. They weaken the grid, basically. Now, as my friend Hassan just concluded that some of the miners may not always meet the IWP standards. So if such a mining facility is subjected to a low voltage, there is possibility of disturbance being created which can impact on the grid. Now, as it is as it is obvious that due to these penetration of high inverter-based resources, which includes even the Bitcoin or mining loads, we will have in search or huge instabilities, which is not possible to uh, simulate in normal softwares, you may say. For this, we require dynamic transient simulations to analyze these effects. Also, if I were to make you or to emphasize on how critical this is, I'll take an example of a recent event wherein an inverter based resource like a wind turbine was not connected properly with the grid and how majorly it impacted on the power system assets. In March 22, at Panhandle, Texas, around 4 o'clock in the early morning, there was a wind turbine tripping, which was a generator line fault, and this created a more sequential tripping of other wind turbines. Some of the wind turbines, zero output, some even reduced output. Frequency was dropped in, responsive reserves were brought in, and the fault was cleared like within three cycles. Cut to, within like 15, 20 minutes later, there was another tripping on another wind farm, and this was now at a transmission line. This magnitude of tripping might be around 400 megawatt, but I'm not specifying on the reduction of load. What the main concern was the unexpected tripping of loads that too far away from the fault location. So then Urquhart and Nurk, they sat together, they prepared a report and analyzed the causes of the event. And the root causes we mentioned were, you have plant control interactions, AC tripping, and subsynchronous operation. Now, uh, the first two might be prevalent by the name itself. However, if uh, I have to explain subsynchronous in a very layman language, it's, I take an analogy of a transmission line model, which is generally modeled as a resistance and inductor in series. And most of the transmission line models in power system are series compensated. That is, they have a capacitor in series with it. So it forms as an RLC branch. And we know by basic electrical fundamental that the frequency of oscillation is given as 1 upon 2 times C. Now, whenever this frequency of oscillation, which is very less than the sub asynchronous value, that's why it's known as subsynchronous, it matches with any of the torsional mode frequencies of the generator, it can lead to fatal failures of the generator. And the interesting part is, all of these major concerns 
where involving analysis which devolve in like milliseconds to microsecond range. So for doing these type of or to analyze these type of causes, we need to do these EMD studies. This shows that if inverter based resources, be it wind turbine or Bitcoin or mining facilities, if they are not being really interconnected with the grid in proper form like how it is supposed to, these can be the fatal failures which can impact on the grid. So with this, let me delve directly to the EMTP model. That is why, we, what is the purpose of this EMTP? So what we did is in agony of this context, we went to Raya facility. We noticed that they were using ant finders. And uh, we then came back, we served website and saw this block diagram of a basic uh, a printed circuit board, you can say, of an ant finder. Then we um, visualized the actual power supply within the ant miner. This is the block diagram in which our main focus was on the rectifier power uh, factor character and the capacitor part. Beyond which it's all easy. So it does not interact much with the grid. But our main focus was on this boost PFC model. So we had to build this boost PFC model which could replicate an Bitcoin miner and build it in the software wherein there's no such already available uh, models available in any of these softwares. So this is our basic block diagram. And we have used EMTP software for this. We can use other softwares too, but these are very high transient software. Like you cannot do any uh, these specific uh, application softwares. After building the model, the first normal thing, because this is built directly from scratch, we needed to validate the model. The best way of validating is we already have lab results with us and we have a melting with us. So we took the points which they could, meaning across the voltage, how they were performing. We took those particular points and specifically those which were on the boundary of the curve. So the ones which would be like, which should not trip, we noticed that they were not tripping. And the ones should trip, they were tripping. So we could come up to a success that yeah, the model we created was matching the actual report we have in the lab. After making the block model, then we have to integrate further to the larger system for which we connected these minor loads into a large cluster form and connected it with the transmission network. In this, you can see this is the transmission network of the every uh, model, which consists of two loads of 30 megawatt, one solar PV power of 75 MPa. Here, you can consider this as a Bitcoin or crypto mining facility and each of the phase has 100 units of 3.5 kilowatt single phase converters. So the total load can be come around 1 megawatt which is connected to a 1 MVA transformer. In this, we were considered two case scenarios. In one case scenario, the fault is applied on the load end you see the impact, how the converters are, whether it is tripping or not, when it should or not. And then in the next scenario, we are applying fault on the grid side and checking how the converters are getting impacted through this. So in case one, we are applying fault on the grid side, uh, sorry, on the lab side. So if you notice, we have put a voltage measurement block to check the converter input voltage. This is the summary of the various simulations which we perform, and uh, we have done it across different cycles. Like uh, when the fault voltage was 75%, 50%, 25 to almost uh, to zero itself, zero voltage, and made through different fault cycles, like nine milliseconds, one cycle, three cycle, two hundred milliseconds. For all of these situations, as you can see, the upper half of each uh, table, when the voltage is very close to the nominal voltage it is riding through, which it should do as per the curve. However, as the voltage is reducing to very drastic, like 25% to 0%, and if the fault clearance time is increasing, it will eventually trip. Uh, I have presented some of the 
stressors of that first scenario. Like this is an instance where the fault voltage was 50 percent. We had a fault cycle for one cycle, and after the cycle or the fault gets cleared, you might notice that the currents are still the upper graph is of the currents, the converted currents. I mean the minor currents, and it is still able to drive through. Like the currents are still flowing above. So in this case, the minors in all the three phases could drive through. In the next scenario, we have taken zero, like a voltage short circuit fault. And all of these simulations are done on three phase fault, which means that is the worst case contingency, which is rarely expected, but this is the short circuit which normally any power electrical engineer will do their analysis for. So um, when we did it for zero voltage and ran it for like one cycle, we noticed that after some time, when the fault got cleared, you can see there's sudden uh, like spikes of the current, and after which it gets dropped. Like the protection kicks in and the minors get tripped. So in this case, none of the minors of any phase were able to ride through. Then came case two, wherein now we are applying fault on the grid end and observing its impact on the low end, which is the mining facility. Here we have put two voltage scopes, one to measure the grid voltage, that is the actual fault voltage, and the other one to see the input converter voltage which is coming to the mining facility. After tabulating the results, you can see that in comparison with case one, here in case two, even with nominal, when this, like, the voltage is around 75%, that is very close to nominal voltage, at least one of the uh, phases were tripping. So this was a bit startling for us because you would expect them as the fault is very far away and this is still happening the case though. And as the voltage is reducing, it is obvious that it will basically trip. We presented some of the cases, like one case where we had 75% of the source voltage. We ran the fault for 100 milliseconds, which is still quite a larger time scale for a fault. And then uh, we can notice that the, after the fault got cleared, there were sudden spikes in the current, which it's supposed to be. And then one of the phases got tripped up. However, if you notice, the voltage across the minor facility it has not reduced that differently. That's because there's a huge transmission line between the grid side and the load end, which creates a lot of impedance for the voltage to still be considerably high. And uh, with these, like these with some of the examples which I've shown you, but with this we can, we, I'll just continue the tutorial in this point by emphasizing that we know this integration of these ideas as inverted phase resources, be it Bitcoin, solar, renewable, this with the grid will lead to a lot of instability in the grid. As I just told you, that impacts were huge, like not even at the point of fault. So it requires to be done. Like these are not uh, like any simulation software can do it. It requires special EMD models to be built for that, to study them, to analyze them, and then to determine whether interconnection is possible or not, whether it is suiting the requirement or not. So we do require EMD analysis to ensure proper interconnection and state ready check. And here we have built an EMD model of the crypto mining facility and validated it against the lab results obtained. Then we integrated this model in a system network to check for the impact on the grid. And after which, in the future, we can even expand this model to further represent larger Bitcoin nodes and to a bigger network, maybe the Texas Synthetic Bus Network. With this, I would like to conclude my tutorial. And if you have any questions, please to ask. Thank you. So first, I want to start off uh, on the topic of carbon emissions, because uh, the New York Times wrote a hit piece about uh, Bitcoin mining and about our facility uh, essentially accusing us of uh, emitting a lot of carbon emissions, uh, which was really confusing to us because uh, these are just computers, so they don't really emit any CO2. 
And uh, this gave us an opportunity to learn about what's called carbon accounting. And I put accounting in air quotes because I'm an actual accountant, and this is not accounting at all. Uh, but you know, the, the proponents of it call it accounting. Uh, so the carbon accounting, when you start looking into the details, uh, they've got three scopes. Uh, scope one is what I would call actual emissions, right? Actual greenhouse gases coming out of a smokestack that is an asset owned by the company, right? It's a direct emission from uh, the, uh, an asset that's on your balance sheet. Scope two, quote unquote emissions, are uh, simulated estimates of third parties' scope one emissions based on the fact that you bought electricity from them. Uh, and so the, the idea here is that you caused them to emit CO2 or other greenhouse gases uh, by buying electricity from them. And then scope three has to do with uh, the whole uh, supply chain, as they call it. Although in practice, there's not really any difference between scope two and scope three because electricity is just part of the supply chain anyway. Um, and you know, as, as I started learning about this, I mean, this is, has nothing to do with Bitcoin, but I was, I, this was forced onto us by the New York Times. Um, as I was learning about carbon accounting, uh, what I found was that uh, there's lots of problems with it. And, you know, the, 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 the root problem, and I'll go quickly here because this is irrelevant, uh, is that if you're taking financial accounting, um, you know, 301 or whatever it's called here, uh, you know about the entity assumption, right? That your financial statements should be limited to the economic entity or the legal entity. Um, whereas scope two and scope three emissions are violating that entity assumption and bringing in liabilities from other companies and including it into uh, your disclosures or your accounting of uh, emissions. And so um, this caused a huge debate inside of the Bitcoin community and then adjacently with environmentalists of, hey, look, if you're going to say that a Tesla is a zero emission electric vehicle, then shouldn't you also say that a Bitcoin mining rig is a zero emission electric miner, uh, given the fact that both are just consuming electricity and e not emitting any CO2? Um, and uh, the, you know, saying that, or, or conversely, you know, if we want to say that Bitcoin mining is emitting CO2, then so are Teslas, because when you charge your Tesla, that's a coal or natural gas power plant that is uh, providing the electricity in most cases. Um, and, and then it, it broke out on Twitter. They tweeted out this story about all of our carbon emissions. Uh, the company replied with a video from our expert videographer here, Gabe, uh, who... Uh, that was all your idea. <laughs> Uh, I, I went on site with a CO2 meter and I measured our CO2 emissions. And what we found was that we don't have any carbon emissions. Um, and so this, this video was very much, uh, you know, kind of in the style of, of The Daily Show, you know, kind of satire. Uh, but the, the, the environmentalists were not happy about it at all because obviously we should be morally responsible for the actions of third parties. Um, so, um, I would argue that, that uh, coal-fired power plants and natural gas power plants, uh, they should own their emissions uh, because they're the ones emitting the, the, the greenhouse gases. And that's also a view held by the EPA. And so the EPA actually has a rulemaking process around, OK, how are we going to limit greenhouse gas emissions from electricity production rather than trying to go to everybody who's consuming electricity and haranguing them about consuming less electricity? which doesn't really make any sense when we can create an infinite amount of carbon-free electricity using nuclear power or you know, wind or solar, et cetera. Um, on top of that, uh, Bitcoin mining's scope two emissions, right, if we uh, adopt this framework, are uh, pretty immaterial compared to global scope one emissions and uh, substantially less than some, some you know, case studies like here in Turkmenistan where they have massive gas leaks that are uh, just spewing uh, methane into the atmosphere. And you can see it from satellite imagery. Um, and so you know, the, it's a lot easier for the New York Times to come after uh, Bitcoin miners uh, rather than going after Turkmenistan. Um, you can imagine why. 
Okay, so that's a brief digression on uh, carbon accounting, which I found to be interesting as an accountant uh, because it's pretty bogus. Okay, so the grid. Um, this is a, an old uh, chart of kind of the large high voltage uh, transmission lines here in Texas. Uh, now it's much denser, uh, there's a lot more complexity. And what I really want to show here is that this is a very complex network. And uh, ERCOT is the grid operator, and they have the very hard uh, job of managing this grid. Um, and it's really unfortunate that in the aftermath of Winter Storm Uri, ERCOT caught a lot of blame uh, for our power going out. D raise your hand if your power went out, uh, Winter Storm Uri. Yeah, I had a newborn at home. Uh, it was very unpleasant to have the power out for a whole week. Uh, and it caused us tremendous stress and anxiety, but it was not ERCOT's fault. Uh, in fact, ERCOT should actually get credit for the fact that they prevented things from getting worse. We could have had the power out for months if ERCOT had not taken decisive action to prevent the grid from literally melting down. Um, what, what was at fault was a combination of factors, and it, anytime something goes wrong in a complex system, it's very rarely going to be one factor, right? It's going to be a cascading effect of different things. Um, the natural gas power plants um, were not weatherized, and so that freezing caused natural gas to freeze, uh, and so those power plants could no longer operate. On top of that, when ERCOT did start doing rolling blackouts, unfortunately, some uh, natural gas infrastructure was not marked as essential, and so they were getting turned off. When in, and so you know that, that causes further problems. Uh, and then on top of that, um, you know, if snow is falling on a solar panel, it's not going to be particularly effective. And if a uh, uh, wind generator is frozen stuck, then it's also not going to be able to generate electricity. So there were lots of different causes. Everyone was pointing fingers at each other, uh, and ERCOT was caught in the middle as kind of just, uh, hey, you're the grid operator. You have reliability in your name, uh, and uh, there's no reliability to be had. So um, since then, they have weatherized natural gas power plants, uh, and they have taken quite a few measures to improve reliability. So um, if we look back at this summer, this summer has represented record demand for electricity in Texas. Um, record peak demand because of so many people moving here. Uh, and one stat I saw was a 20% increase versus last year. Um, and despite that record demand, we did not have any brown or blackouts. So uh, I think ERCOT actually deserves credit for navigating this uh, situation. Um, and it's not just about demand, it's also about supply. We have uh, record levels of solar and wind here in Texas, and those are sources of electricity that ERCOT cannot control. And so they have to manage around those resources, and they've done a great job uh, doing that. Okay, so how does uh, the grid electricity market work? You've got the spot market. So every five or 15 minutes increment, uh, people uh, around Texas, uh, electricity traders are buying and selling electricity. Um, and then they're also buying and selling electricity for tomorrow in the day ahead market. Um, and they're also doing it you know, for electricity in 10 years. So for example, Raya is in what's called a power purchase agreement where we have bought electricity, pre-purchased electricity for the next 10 years so that we're hedging our risk in case electricity prices go up. You can kind of think of it as like a derivative, a hedge. Um, you also have uh, what's called ancillary services markets. And these are um, what, what I'd characterize as a sub-market within this, where ERCOT is the one buying and selling electricity. And the reason ERCOT wants to be in that market buying and selling electricity is because they're going to use that electricity in order to deliver a particular service to the grid of reliability. And this is unique to the electricity market where on a sub-second level, on a millisecond level, you need to have supply and demand matching in real time. Most markets, right, 
you, you can have inventory pile up and it's not a big deal. Uh, electricity has to be delivered in real time from the power plant to your home. Um, now, we got some development of batteries, but it's basically a material at this point compared to, to the rest of the grid. Um, and so ERCOT uh, acquires, um, uh, what they do is that they go to the market and they say, okay, we need a certain amount of capacity in order to manage this reliability and in order to be able to control particular loads and particular generators uh, so that we're matching supply and demand. Uh, and they do this in a market-based process so that they're not, um, you know, essentially nationalizing resources, right? They want uh, this to be, um, you know, here in Texas, like we're, we're not uh, trying to do communist central planning. Uh, they want to have the market actually have price signals. Um, and that way, it, it makes a lot of sense because you have resources that don't necessarily have to consume electricity at a particular time. And so that means that ERCOT can buy services from them more cheaply than they would if they were trying to pay uh, you know, somebody to not run their AC when it's 100 degrees outside. So the duck curve is basically saying, um, what's the load minus solar? Because as you can see during the day here, this curve goes down, right? Because solar uh, electricity is producing. And so it actually uh, offsets demand. Um, and then in the evening, as the sun sets, uh, that net load uh, rapidly increases. And this is good in, in the sense that, hey, you know, solar power, um, it, it, the, we don't have to pay for the sun, right? I think that's the, the pitch for solar power is that you don't have to pay for the fuel, you just have to pay for the upfront capital investment of setting up the solar panel. Um, but then you get free electricity uh, from the sun. Um, but then when the sun sets, uh, as y'all know from this past summer, it's still hot outside even when the sun sets, right? It's still like 199 degrees. Uh, and uh, so people are still turning on their air conditioning. And so uh, the load dramatically increases at that time. This causes a problem for the grid, uh, which is that we have to go through what's called uh, the dispatch curve. So the dispatch curve is uh, something that's maintained by ERCOT, where all of the electricity generators say, OK, at this time tomorrow, I will turn on my power plant, and at this price. Um, and then you know, depending on the economics or the electrical engineering of uh, the power generator, uh, they're going to be somewhere on this dispatch curve. So nuclear will always bid in, because you don't turn nuclear power plants on and off, right? Um, imagine Homer Simpson doing that. That would be bad. Um, uh, here in Texas, we don't really have uh, hydro, per se. But if you go to Canada or um, uh, you know, the Pacific Northwest, you, you've got baseload hydro. We do have a tremendous amount of coal and gas here in Texas, of baseload coal and, coal and gas. Um, now, one of the big decarbonization stories that uh, doesn't often get told is that uh, natural gas has massively grown here in Texas in terms of its market share for electricity, and that has been to the detriment of coal. And natural gas emits 50% less CO2 per megawatt than coal does. Um, and so it's actually helped reduce carbon emissions by having more natural gas and less coal. Um, then you have the importing of power, which we do very little here in Texas. And uh, you know, you'll know you hear news articles that people will say, oh, we need to import more power, and that will solve all our problems. And it's like, um, how much power do you think you can import from Oklahoma or from Louisiana or New Mexico? Like These are not giant power generating states. So uh, I think that's a little bit of you know magical thinking. Um, then um, gas combined cycle here, these are um, you know, power plants, ga natural gas power plants that um, are like baseload gas, but they turn on and off. Um, and then at the top, you have gas peaking. And gas peaking can turn on in 30 minutes. Uh, gas peaking is really interesting. Uh, you, you, uh, you take a 747 um, jet plane, right? You, you know, the giant turbines on the wings. Uh, you take it off the wing. You put it inside of a building. 
uh, and you can produce electricity. And so that's uh, what a natural gas peaker plant is, is basically a, uh, they call it aeroderivative uh, turbine uh, that instead of feeding um, you know, jet fuel into it, they feed natural gas into it and it produces electricity uh, very quickly. You can turn it on very quickly. Um, so when we are going through this duck curve, uh, that means that we have to uh, essentially go through this dispatch curve and speed run it. Um, because the sunset here in Texas, it's basically an hour. And so in an hour, we have to go from base load to gas peaking, uh, and that causes um, the electricity price to be very volatile. If you go to ERCOT.com, uh, you'll be able to uh, see what's going on currently with the grid. They have an excellent dashboard. Um, and so when, when times are good, uh, $20, uh, let's go back here, uh, $20 per megawatt is about two cents per kilowatt. Um, and then when a uh, natural gas peaking plant will turn on around $100 per megawatt, which is 10 cents per kilowatt. Um, and once you run out of uh, natural gas peaker plants, which has happened several times this summer, uh, electricity prices go from $100 to $5,000 in the blink of an eye. Because uh, there's, there, you, you cannot generate more electricity. And on the, on the demand side for electricity, demand is very uh, uh, price inelastic. And so uh, it's actually one of the biggest problems with operating an electricity grid is that um, somebody's going to turn on their air conditioning and they don't care if it costs $5 instead of 10 cents, right? It's hot outside, so they're going to turn it on. They don't care. And on top of that, there's kind of an information asymmetry where they don't even know that it costs $5 when they're turning it on. Uh, they, they might find out the next month if their electricity provider doesn't give them a fixed rate. Um, and most electricity providers uh, will give people a fixed rate, and then they'll absorb all the risk of uh, the price on their end. Um, so it's a giant problem for electricity grids. Now, the amazing thing that um, the Bitcoin miners provide to the grid is that Bitcoin miners will turn off based on the price of electricity. Um, so, uh, and we call this the break-even price. Basically, at, at what electricity price does a Bitcoin miner turn off their, their load? Um, and it depends on a lot of different factors. Um, won't uh, get into all of them here, but one is the miner efficiency, which is basically, okay, for an amount of electricity, um, how much money can a Bitcoin mining rig generate? And so the more efficient a miner is, the higher their break-even is. Um, if the price of Bitcoin is skyrocketing, uh, then so is the break-even price. So uh, the break-even price for Bitcoin miners this past summer has been between $90 and $100 per megawatt. If the Bitcoin price were to double overnight, that would cause the break-even to go double as well to $180 to $200. Um, and uh, that would also cause more people to start mining Bitcoin which would increase the network difficulty, which uh, I'll discuss later uh, in the second half of today. Um, and uh, I'll also talk about the halving and transaction fees. So this is a visualization, a graph of a Bitcoin mining uh, a, a riots facility uh, during last summer in July. And so in red is the price of electricity. Uh, the price of electricity gets abbreviated to LMP. Uh, locational marginal price, because different places on the grid have different prices of electricity depending on transmission lines being able to uh, move that uh, commodity around. Um, and so what you see here is that when the electricity price goes parabolic because of a supply and demand mismatch, the Bitcoin miners turn off. And Bitcoin mining, as it's just you know a computer, uh, it can turn off very quickly in seconds. Uh, and so we're able to shed 400 megawatts of load and essentially, instead of delivering that electricity to us, 
the power company will deliver the electricity to others. And by selling that electricity back to the grid, we're helping prevent the price from going further up because we're essentially uh, bringing supply onto the market in a, in, a, uh, in a virtual manner, right? We're not like a battery that is actually sending out electricity, um, but we're not taking delivery of electricity and we're redirecting that delivery to somebody else. So um, this is a deep dive into ancillary services uh, that I'll gloss over and then Texas legislature stuff. Um, but let me actually just hop on over to the other uh, slide deck and I can go fast forward to uh, the Bitcoin mining. So when you are using a Bitcoin wallet, it will create a Bitcoin transaction and it will broadcast it out to the Bitcoin network. And this is a helpful visualization of the Bitcoin network um, where you have all of these Bitcoin nodes here. And some of these Bitcoin nodes are connected to what's called a mining pool. And that mining pool is connected to all of these, um, or rather the mining rigs are connected to the mining pool. Uh, and so these mining rigs are computers that are performing hashes, which I'll, I'll describe in, in, a, in a second. Um, and the reason, so when you broadcast your transaction out to the Bitcoin network, that pool will include that transaction inside of a block, and then it'll send the block to the miners for them to hash it. Um, so the transactions roll up into a block header, uh, and then they, the block header um, has also a timestamp of uh, the current time. Um, the, okay, so this is, this is actually really important. So the, um, where should I start with this? So the purpose of Bitcoin mining is to create a decentralized clock. Uh, so it's basically, if you have a ledger, you're going to need to order the transactions. Otherwise, people are going to be able to spend the same money twice. This is the double spending problem. So having a decentralized clock allows you to order the transactions in a way that cannot be manipulated um, by anyone. So uh, recently, there was a scandal with Wells Fargo. As always, it's Wells Fargo. I don't know why. So I hope Crook didn't work at Wells Fargo. Uh, they, uh, they were reordering transactions to maximize the overdraft fees. So instead of ordering the transactions when they came in, they would do, OK, what was the highest value one, and then uh, you know, do it that way um, in order to maximize their fee revenue. So anytime you have a centralized clock, um, the whole system becomes centralized. Uh, because at that point, uh, the, the, the timekeeper can um, inflate the money supply uh, by double spending. Um, so you need to have a decentralized clock. Satoshi's, arguably, this is the only thing Satoshi invented was a decentralized clock, um, and then tying it into a monetary system uh, and providing the incentives around it. So how does this decentralized clock work? Um, I liken it to if I ask you to flip a coin and get heads five times in a row. So it would take you a while for you to get heads five times in a row, right? Uh, just based on the laws of probability and on the fact that it, it takes time to flip a coin. Um, now, if you were really fast at flipping the coin, what I could do is say, OK, now I'll get six heads in a row. And so now I've increased the difficulty, and it's going to take you longer. And so that's how the Bitcoin network um, is able to calibrate this clock so that it ticks every 10 minutes. That is that if, um, and, and the coin flipping, rather than a coin flip, which would be pretty cool if we had machines that flipped coins at our facility. Uh, but um, the coin flip is actually a cryptographic function. And uh, it's called a hash function. So a hash function, for those not in computer science, I'll do a brief recap of a hash function, which is that you take any piece of data, you pass it through this function, and it will give you a fixed length random output. And if you put the same data through the same function, you will always get that same random output. So it's deterministic. If you change the data, even a little bit, even just flipping one zero to a one, and you put it through the function, the random output will be completely different. It won't be a little bit different. It'll be completely randomly different. So that random output 
is the coin flip. The data going into the function is the block. The, so the miners are passing data into this function over and over and over in the hopes that that random output will have a certain number of leading zeros. And leading zeros are like having sequential coin flips of 10 heads in a row. Um, because uh, it, it could be a zero, but it could be any alphanumeric character. Now, it's hexadecimal, so it's not any alphanumeric character. But uh, in any case, uh, the point here is that um, the difficulty is how many leading zeros is the network asking for. Um, and you might wonder, OK, but aren't they putting the same data through the function? So aren't they getting the same hash all the time? Uh, they would, except for one variable, which is the nonce here. And so every time they pass the data into the function, they increment the nonce in order to change the data so that they are hoping right, that the resulting hash, the resulting random numbers and letters, will have a certain number of leading zeros. Um, and when they have that, then they broadcast that block out to the Bitcoin network and say, hey, look, here's our hash. Here's the data we put into it. Anybody can verify that this hash is actually a cryptographic fingerprint unique to that data. Um, now, the other thing to note here, uh, there's a, a transaction, a special transaction inside the block that is created by the mining pool. Uh, this transaction is called the Coinbase transaction, which has nothing to do with the exchange Coinbase. Coinbase stole their name from Bitcoin, which really speaks to their corporate ethics. I mean, this is how they always operate on everything they steal. Um, so uh, the Coinbase transaction is, the, is a transaction created by the mining pool that pays the mining pool. And so um, because it's part of that hash, if you receive the block data and you think, oh, well, I've got the block data here. I've got the winning hash. Why don't I swap out the Coinbase transaction with my own so that I'm getting paid? Well, guess what? Now that data will not produce that same hash because you've changed the data, right? Um, and so the, the nonce and the Coinbase transaction are intertwined such that the mining pool is confident they can broadcast this out to the public and it doesn't, nobody will be able to steal the money um, uh, from the Coinbase transaction. OK, now let's zoom in on the Coinbase transaction. Where is, what, what is paying the Bitcoin miners? Um, part of it is what's called the subsidy. Now, I don't like that term because the subsidies are only done by the government. This has nothing to do with the government. But in any case, that's, that's uh, what, what the programmers decided to call it. Um, I don't know that Satoshi even called it the subsidy. Uh, yes, he did. Yeah, the, the function is called get block subsidy. So this is all Satoshi's fault. Um, so the subsidy is new Bitcoin being added to the ledger. When Satoshi Nakamoto launched Bitcoin in January of 2009, there were zero Bitcoin on the ledger. So it was unusable, right? Uh, Bitcoin have been added to the ledger every 10 minutes from the Coinbase transaction that is paying the miner. And that's the only way Bitcoins can be added to the ledger. Contrary to other cryptocurrencies where uh, there's lots of ways to add units to the ledger. Um, and that's why I think Bitcoin's really special. Um, the other thing to note about the subsidy is that it gets cut in half every four years worth of blocks, which is 210,000 blocks. Um, because a block comes out every 10 minutes on average, and so uh, there's 210,000 10 minutes inside of a year, something that you learn as you learn about Bitcoin. Um, otherwise, completely useless fact, I think. Um, so every four, uh, four years. So um, in 2012, the subsidy got cut from 50 Bitcoin every 10 minutes to 25 Bitcoin every 10 minutes. And then it got cut in half again in 2016 to 12 and a half Bitcoin, and then again um, to uh, 6.25 Bitcoin. Um, and um, now next year, it will be cut to 3.125 Bitcoin. Uh, it will be the fourth halving, and everybody will be celebrating except the Bitcoin miners 
because our revenue is getting cut in half, right? Which is catastrophic. Um, but it's not catastrophic because uh, all of our NPV calculations already factored it in, so it won't really affect anything. So that's one part of the Coinbase transaction. The other part is the transaction fees. So all the other transactions in the block are spending less Bitcoin than they are unlocking. So if you look at kind of how a transaction works under the hood, it's unlocking some quantity of Bitcoin, and then it's moving it, and then locking it back up as you're sending it to somebody. You're always um, locking up less Bitcoin than you unlocked. And that difference, that residual amount in each transaction is a transaction fee that then gets included inside of the Coinbase transaction that's paying the miner. Um, the transaction fees are incentivizing the miner to include your transaction in the block. Uh, you might wonder, OK, why don't the miners just include transactions out of the goodness of their heart? Well, for one, the more uh, transactions you include in a block, uh, the more data that is. Uh, and so at a really kind of uh, microeconomic level, um, you would want to not include any transactions so that you can broadcast your block faster than anybody else in the edge case that you have found the winning hash at approximately the same time as somebody else. And so you, you, you don't want all that cargo with you, uh, you know, holding you back. Um, so the, 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 the people using Bitcoin who are sending and receiving, trans or specifically who are sending transactions, um, want to include a uh, fee for that uh, transaction to be included in a block. Furthermore, there is a limit to the size of blocks. So uh, when Satoshi was about to leave the project in 2010, uh, we don't know why he left. It's a complete mystery. Uh, I wish I knew, but uh, it's yeah. There's there's not even like clues uh, out there. He just he said he was interested in other projects, and so he moved on. So. Um, that's cool. Uh, but uh, when he, before, right before he left, he made a series of changes to the Bitcoin code. And these changes um, were changes that were really focused on hardening the Bitcoin code in order to make it um, more resistant to cyber attacks, basically, and specifically to denial of service attacks. So one um, change he made that has really had kind of repercussions, uh, you know, for the subsequent 13 years so far, right, since 2010, uh, is adding a block size limit. And this was a hard-coded limit that said each block cannot be greater than one megabyte. And so when the nodes are verifying the block being proposed by the Bitcoin miner, they all verify that that block uh, is within this constraint. And if it's not, then the block is marked as invalid and the miner does not receive any revenue. So uh, he added this block size limit because he saw that there's a key vulnerability in Bitcoin, which is that if a miner creates a massive block, he could cause all of the nodes to crash because you would overwhelm the computing resources of all the nodes um, by creating a massive block. Uh, and so having this block size limit prevents that, 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 that um, attack from happening. Uh, because if a miner can do that and crash all the nodes, then at that point, that miner controls the network. Uh, and they, get, they could say, hey, actually, uh, we're going to create more Bitcoin uh, for ourselves, right? <laughs> not for you guys. Um, and so uh, that's uh, something that Satoshi added right before he left the project. But it's been very controversial because it's a fixed number. And since Satoshi added that limit, obviously interest in Bitcoin has tremendously grown. And at times, the demand for block space has exceeded one megabyte per block. And when the demand is greater than the supply, the transaction fees uh, skyrocket. And so um, here is the, uh, so the, the block size limit. You can kind of see we started hitting it here. And then at the end of 2017, uh, the Bitcoin network activated an upgrade called SegWit, which allowed for a, a marginal increase in the size of blocks. Um, I won't get into the specifics of how that works, but that's in the orange. 
Um, but it, effectively, the block size limit is still four megabytes now. Uh, so it has technically quadrupled, uh, but in practice, it's more around like two megabytes. Um, and when, so when, when, um, when there's more demand than there is supply, uh, you see the transactions pile up in a queue that's called the mempool. So each Bitcoin node, including the mining pools, um, maintains a backlog of transactions that are waiting to get into the next block. And it rank orders those transactions based on the transaction fee. So whoever is paying the highest transaction fee will get their transaction included in the next block. Um, and so this here shows that uh, when we were flatlining in 2017, transaction fees skyrocketed. And you know, since then, they've been you know, much more moderate. I should update this chart because we had a little spike uh, earlier this year. Um, but it's generally just been uh, pretty low. Um, and the, um, so the transaction fees are essentially like Uber surge pricing, right? It's a congestion pricing mechanism so that we're not causing the Bitcoin network to have so many transactions that it becomes centralized. Um, because another situation you could imagine is that if running a Bitcoin node becomes very expensive, then only Google, Amazon, Microsoft will be able to run a Bitcoin node in their massive data centers. And at that point, they would control the Bitcoin network and they would be able to issue themselves more Bitcoin. What maintains kind of the credibility of Bitcoin's monetary policy is the low cost of running a Bitcoin node because it's only by running a Bitcoin node that you can actually verify that um, more Bitcoin have not been created, right? That there hasn't been inflation. Um, okay, so that was transaction fees. <laughs> um, so the subsidy plus the transaction fees equals the mining reward. Um, so you have on one hand, the transaction fees are, or sorry, the subsidy is getting cut in half. Um, every four years, and that is very predictable. The transaction fees are very volatile, just depending on um, how many people are trying to use Bitcoin, uh, which is usually related to the Bitcoin price, right? So when the Bitcoin price is skyrocketing, you have a bunch of degenerate traders who are trying to move their Bitcoin from this exchange to that exchange or to their wallet, um, and so it just causes lots of activity on the network, um, and it causes Bitcoin's transaction fees to skyrocket. Um, and then on top of that, you multiply the mining reward by whatever the dollar exchange rate is of uh, Bitcoin is, right? So um, when the Bitcoin price is going at you know, $60,000, that means that in, in dollar terms, uh, the Bitcoin miners are earning a tremendous amount of, of revenue. I could pause here, see if we can do a Q&A. So important, and kind of what else goes into your business strategy moving forward? Great question. So um, I should tie this back to the beginning of the presentation about um, Bitcoin miners and, and our, our break-even price, right? Which is that um, you know, we're, we're described as a large flexible load. Uh, large because we're consuming massive amounts of electricity because the mining reward is so significant. Flexible because a hash happens in the blink of an eye. And so we can turn off a mining rig, and it's not like we're losing any work in process. Work, or, you know, there, there's no, like, um, if, if you turn off an AWS data center, uh, now somebody was in the middle of doing something on a website, and they've lost all their data, right? Um, we're highly interruptible. And so uh, that's, that's why we're, we're a flexible load. Um, and that's what allows us to be highly responsive to what's going on on the grid. Um, on top of the fact that the, um, our break even you know, of $100 per megawatt, if you look at AWS, their break even is north of $5,000 per megawatt. Because if they interrupt service for their clients, their clients don't care that Texas is experiencing a heat wave, right? Their clients are processing medical records for Indiana, right? Like they, so uh, they, their break even is you know, way too high for ERCOT or for the grid. And so um, they wouldn't turn off their data center just based on the price of electricity. Um, now, 
as far as our, our business model is concerned, um, Riot, Riot's approach to Bitcoin mining is to have uh, vertical integration. So if you're purely just mining Bitcoin, you know, by, and there's lots of different business models around this, but, um, you know, so, some only own the Bitcoin mining rigs. And so they will pay for hosting at a facility. Um, Riot has a, owns the real estate, owns the land, or has long-term lease on the land. We own the construction company that builds the mining facility. That's all done internally. Um, and then uh, you know, we also own the electrical equipment manufacturer. So we acquired uh, ESS Metron based up in Colorado. And so um, our view is that Bitcoin mining is a hyper competitive industry because there's free entry. You don't need a, a license or anything to start mining Bitcoin, and it's global. So even in, um, like we're competing against uh, North Koreans and Iranians and Russians, right? Who all these people are sanctioned and uh, no other US business is competing against them because they're banned from competing on the global market, right? Not, not the case with Bitcoin mining. Bitcoin mining is completely permissionless. So there's no way for us to stop anybody else from mining Bitcoin. And so it is a hyper competitive industry where uh, we've seen many of our competitors go out of business because they didn't have a cost structure that um, you know, had the right unit economics. And so for us, it's all about how do we be the lowest cost producer? And to be the lowest cost producer, you have to control the supply chain. And you have to be able to bring down costs you know, uh, from that vertical integration. Um, on top of that, you know, we're focused on Texas because Texas is the energy capital of the world. And as a large consumer of electricity, it makes a lot of sense to be in the energy capital of the world. Because um, you, you might look at a map and you say, oh, well, hey, look, uh, in Wyoming, they have a lower price of electricity. OK, but if you build a 400 megawatt facility in Wyoming, you will be consuming more electricity than exists in Wyoming. And you will drive up the price of electricity in Wyoming massively, right? So um, you also have to look at the depth of the market. And Texas, um, you know, it has a depth of, let's say, 80 gigawatts of electricity um, for us to tap into. So um, you know, the, the geographic location matters a lot in terms of having a cost that um, isn't just low at one single point in time, but is low across time. So, um, you know, during the summer, yeah, we, during the day, you had electricity prices at 5,000. And then at night, electricity prices can be negative because there's lots of wind blowing in West Texas and, uh, you know, people turned off their AC at night. Um, and so uh, we have to, you know, look at it kind of through the seasons and even through you know, the daily oscillations in the electricity price uh, to have a business model that um, can, can like, you know, minimize the, the cost of production. With the halving next year in April, May, I think, the all else equal, the cost of production doubles. So let's say our cost of production today is $9,000 per Bitcoin. And the Bitcoin price is at $27,000. With the halving, our cost of production is now $18,000 per Bitcoin. Um, and that's how, that's how the, the industry thinks about it. It's kind of counter, it doesn't make sense to me, but that's how people talk about it. Um, and our competitors, their cost of production today might be uh, $20,000. And so they're in business today, but after the halving, they will be out of business because their cost of production will be greater than the price of Bitcoin. And that means that hash rate will go down, difficulty will go down, uh, our market share will increase. Um, it, it'll be, we'll have more, a greater percentage of a smaller market. Um, and so, you know, I, I think that in Bitcoin mining, it's kind of like, you know, whoever has the lowest cost of production, not only do they have bigger profit margins, but they actually are the only ones that can survive. 
And uh, the others are going to go extinct uh, because they have flawed business models that have too high of costs. Um, now, hypothetically, in the future, we could further vertically integrate by producing our own electricity, right? Acquiring power generation, uh, and you know, there's lots of opportunity there too. Uh, 